Several weeks ago at Bible study, I asked the group a question. And that question was this, what is your vision for your life? I wonder how you would answer that. What's your vision? Do you have a vision? Is there something that you look forward to that you would really like to happen in your life? What are you looking forward to? We came up with several suggestions. Okay, someone said, uh, I'd like to improve my health. My health hasn't been too good. That's what I'd like to do. Another one said, I'd like to uh, have a good relationship with my family. We have our strains and stresses, but I'd like it to get better so we've got a good relationship. Another one said, oh, being very spiritual, I'd learn, like to learn more about God. Another one said, I'd like to improve my financial stability. Well, if I were to ask anyone in the street, particularly this week, what's your vision? A lot of them would say, winning the lottery. Many people regard that wealth would solve all of their problems. I spoke to one guy a couple of years ago. I said, how are you getting on? He said, nothing the winning the lottery wouldn't fix. Just this week, we had a very large lotto draw, didn't we? $100 million. It was suggested that one in three Australians had at least one ticket in that lottery. Maybe some of you had your own ticket. I won't ask you to put your hand up if you did. But would it solve your problems? If you were to win the lottery, would it solve all your problems? If you had all the money you could use, would it help you? I can remember when the first lottery came out, it was 100,000 pounds. Do you remember Graham Thorne? That goes back a long way, doesn't it? But that name stuck in my mind because this family won the 100,000 pounds and a few days later, they got people trying to get it off them. The little boy, Graham Thorne, was kidnapped and a ransom was asked from the people that won the lottery. That little boy was killed. What a terrible thing to happen. Do you think they were happy that they won the lottery? No, I'm sure they weren't. You see, winning the lottery doesn't solve your problems. Having a lot of money doesn't solve all your problems. It's known in fact that many lottery winners have their lives ruined by their so-called good luck. So then what then is your vision for your future? Just spend a moment just thinking about that. What, what are you looking forward to? What do you want to work towards? Some of you might say, well, I'm getting a bit old and uh, I, I just want to take it easy for the rest of my life. Others would say, no, I've got a real desire to do something with my life. I wonder what your vision is. What do you really want to do to improve your life? Well, I personally have spent a great deal of time thinking that through as I prepared for that Bible study. I thought to myself, what is my vision for my life? And I finally came up with an answer. Would you like to know what it is? I want to be more like Jesus. That's my desire. That's my vision, to be more like Jesus. How do I know what he was like? Well, I read the Bible, don't I? And we see what he was like. We see his characteristics. I don't want to get around with a long white dress on and have long hair and a beard. But I want to do the things that he did. I want to be like him. I want to have the characteristics that he showed. So what does it mean that I have to do in order for it to happen? How can I become more like Jesus? And as I've thought about that, I thought there are lots of things that I can do. Some would say, well, read the Bible more. Maybe I'm not reading the Bible as much as I should. Read them. How about praying more often? Prayer is a good thing to do, isn't it? What about helping other people? What about serving God in our church a bit more? And these are all great things, aren't they? They're all really good aims, things to do. They're very helpful suggestions. But do they really get me where I want to go? Do they really get me to be more like Jesus? Let me suggest that something more than these suggestions is needed to happen. Something has to happen to help me to achieve this goal. You see, it's the heart. It's not the actions. It's not the things I do. It's the things that I am that makes me more like him. It's the things that you are, not the things that you do that make you more like him. God in his word has painted a picture of mankind naturally leading everyone to terrible despair. The picture that's painted of 
mankind throughout the Bible and as we go right from Genesis right through to Revelation. We see mankind. Things are not terrible. And we've got a terrible picture of mankind. But God is also painting a wonderful picture of Jesus' remedy for the problem. You see, there is a remedy. So many Christians lead unhappy, unsatisfied, restless lives because they're either ignorant of or disobedient to God's remedy for indwelling sin. Sin that's in there. My sin that you can't even see and you would not imagine. Your sin that no one knows about. It's indwelling sin and the Bible paints that picture. But Jesus has a remedy for that. I dare suggest that some, if not all of us, would be ashamed to admit that we're still sinning. Even though we say we are Christians, even though we say we accepted Jesus as our saviour, we still sin, don't we? And many of us would be ashamed to say what goes on in our minds and our thoughts. After all, we're only human, aren't we? Only human. The remedy in the Bible is that we must do something to our old natures. And Paul put it quite clearly and quite straightforward. He says we must put our old natures to death. We've got to kill our old natures. Let me illustrate this remedy for you. Many of you at some time or other would have been involved in a motor car accident. Perhaps you're driving along minding your own business and uh, you're distracted for a moment and the car in front of you suddenly braked and you slammed into the back. If you'd seen this possibility of a couple of seconds previous, it would have been a quite a different result. You see, stopping a vehicle involves three actions. Firstly, take your foot off the accelerator. Secondly, if it's a manual car, disengage the clutch. And thirdly, apply the brakes. They're the three things required to stop a vehicle. And if you'd had enough time to initiate these actions, you probably could have avoided an accident. You could have killed the force of the engine, killed that force and stopped it from pushing you forwards to towards destruction. The engine could still have been idling, but because of your actions, the result of the engine's force was, was killed. It saved you from, in, in, from injury. In biblical terms, you could say that the power of your vehicle was put to death. It was stopped. It could no longer do any harm. Or well, more specifically, killed your vehicle's forward motion. And the Apostle Paul uses this picture to illocate a deadening of the power of the flesh or the earthly nature. We talk about flesh and sometimes when we think about how the Bible talks about flesh, it means the earthly nature. It means the, the way that I am because I am human. Literally, Paul meant that we were to drain the life of the flesh through the Holy Spirit's assistance. Notice how Paul uses this picture in Romans 8.13 and Colossians 3.1-5. We're not putting them on the screen. I just want you to listen to this picture. Imagine the picture that comes through in these readings. Paul said this, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the earthly nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Since then you've been raised with Christ when you became a Christian. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory he says put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality impurity lust evil desires and greed which is idolatry so I see an illustration in hebrew 11:12, where it's ability of father 100 years old the writer of hebrews commented that abraham's body was as good as dead It's that's killing the earthly nature. 
cause to turn away from the way Jesus went. Becoming a Christian doesn't take away that t- and you It's not the way you should be, not the way the Bible says you should be. How can we possibly be perfect in this body? It's not possible, is it? We still sin. We still have indwelling sin in us. The absolute has been broken, but it's still there. In Romans 8.13, Paul seems to equate flesh with the deeds of the body, what we do with our body. You know very well that, that you can do anything you like. God's given you the ability to do whatever you like with your body. And he implies that the flesh could mean the source of evil, the indwelling sin and the outworking of evil. Sin starts within and moves out. Perhaps the meaning is much the same as our might as ours might be if we saw one of our children about to strike his little sister. We might say to our spouse who's standing near the children, Honey, stop Johnny! Do we mean stop the boy? Or do we mean stop his actions? We mean both because they both are linked. The boy has that indwelling sin, that ability to hurt his sister, and the actions bring it about. So we mean both. So what then is our proper response to this sin that's in us? Are we hopeless? Is there any hope for us at all if we continue to sin, even when we say we have accepted Jesus as our saviour? Is there any hope for us at all? Let's look at a couple of responses given in the Bible. Firstly, according to the passages we read earlier, the flesh and its resulting deeds must be stopped. We've got to stop doing and thinking what we are. Secondly, the self and its ungodly lusts must be denied. We've got to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Luke 9.23 and Titus 2.12 tell us, Jesus said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Denying yourself. When you go to the refrigerator and you see that block of chocolate there, my response is, Mmm. My body says, I need that. I want that. I like that. And my hands reach out and I grab it. Now, what can I do with that situation? I've got a couple of choices. I can quickly shut the fridge door and put it out of my mind, or I can say to myself, No. I've found that's a good antidote, you know. If ever you're tempted to do something, just say no. And you'll find it's got great power. So self and its ungodly lusts must be denied. Thirdly, the deeds of the old self must be put off. We've got to get rid of those things that we do. Those things that you know are not right, that God wouldn't want you to do, put them off. Ephesians 4.22 and Colossians 3.9 says, You were taught with your regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. So if I want to be more like Jesus, I've got to get rid of all those desires and say no to the things that I know are wrong. Fourthly, the indwelling sin nature must not be served. (coughs) Romans 6, 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, when we do the things we know we shouldn't do, we're slaves to them. We're ruled by them. When I see that chocolate, and if I grab out, grab out and hold it, I'm a slave to it, aren't I? We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves. So we mustn't serve our old nature. In our quest then to be more like Jesus, there are several terms that mean the same thing. We can sort of say, well, no, denying self. I deny myself something. I deny myself that chocolate. I deny that, 
that uh, something that I shouldn't watch on TV. I deny myself the wrong thoughts that I'm thinking or the wrong words that I'm saying. So I deny myself. Putting off the deeds of the old self. Get rid of all the old things that I used to do. Refusing to serve sin. Recognising that these things that, that are against God's will are being served by me. But no matter what term we use, the question is, how do I kill my flesh? How do I kill my earthly desires? How do I stop doing the things I know very well that I shouldn't be doing? You ever struggle with that? How can I stop it? How can I even stop thinking about these things? How can I be more like Jesus? Well, fortunately, God's given us a lot of help in this matter. The most detailed instruction on this issue is given in Romans chapter 6. I'm not going to read that to you now, but I encourage you to read Romans chapter 6 when you get home. Read it through several times in your own quiet time. And identify some of the battles that you're facing right now. What is it in your life that if I said to you, are you really living the way Jesus wants you to live? What comes to your mind? What sin, what thought, what action, what comes to your mind when I say this? Read this chapter. Read it constructively. Have battles in mind. Have in mind what causes you. Your problems are different to mine, but you can be sure we all have them. I love Psalm 139, 23 and 24. You probably know it. Search me, O God. And know my heart. This is David talking to God. Search me, Lord. Examine me. See what's going on. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see, the first step is saying, okay, I recognize my sin. I recognize what's wrong in my life. Take it to God and say, God, examine me. Find out what's going wrong with me. And do something about it. Lead me into the way you want me to go. There's various things you may discover. I'll give you a list of some of these things. You might identify with some of these. Worry, deception, lack of endurance, destructive bodily habits such as drugs or drinking or anorexia or bulimia or overeating, anger, a critical spirit, discontent, gossip, grumbling, profanity, and other the sins of the tongue, bitterness, laziness, rebellion to authorities in your life, greed and materialism, gambling, immoral behaviour such as lustful fantasies and pornography. Of course, the list of possibilities is endless, isn't it? I may have touched on something that affects your life, or maybe I haven't. But the list goes on and on. What is it that's taking you away from the way that you know is the way of God? The main point to keep in mind is that none of these possibilities is out of the scope is what is being addressed in Romans chapter 6. Read Romans chapter 6. Have that in mind. What is your problem? And just see what it's being said about. With that in mind, read it. Make your list. And keep trusting God for deliverance to give you help now I'd suggest the following is a starting point firstly cut the fuel to the engine don't feed the flesh if your problem is, is pornography don't look at those pictures don't go and see what's happening out there don't feed the flesh if your problem is chocolate don't buy it <laughs> an engine won't run without fuel will it Disengage the clutch. The power of the engine doesn't have to turn the wheels. The power of indwelling sin has been overruled by Jesus Christ. And lastly, put on the brakes. Deny yourself and be determined, I'm not going to do that anymore. With God's help, and go to God and ask him to show you how you can overcome these things that are causing you problems. Say no to the flesh. But please understand, however, that this only gets the vehicle stopped. It doesn't make it useful in any way. It just keeps it from destroying you. 
There's much more to be learned than how to put off the deeds of the old self. We must learn to be transformed. The Bible says we've got to be changed. When Jesus comes into our lives, we are changed, aren't we? We become his child. But there are many things that need to be put right to get us right to way, the way he wants us to be. We must learn to be transformed, changed into something useful by the renewing of our mind. Our mind needs to be reprogrammed and God can do that. And so we can demonstrate Christ likeness by putting on a new self. I suggest to you that you memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. I believe many of you would probably already know this. These verses will be a big help to you. It goes like this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Don't think you've got to be conformed to the world. Don't think you've got to be the same as what's happening around us. You can be different. That's my goal, to be more like Jesus. I've got a long way to go and I've got the rest of my life to get there. But with God's help, I'm going to keep going. I wonder, are you going to keep going? Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to have his characteristics? Do you want to live for him? Do you want to serve him? Do you want to know what he wants you to do? Read his word. Apply it to your life. Don't be a slacker. Do it. I've given you a handout today. That, that's sermon notes. And I'm glad to see that you weren't reading them along and see where I was up to. Something to take home and to just remind you of the things that I've mentioned today. What is your vision? I trust that your vision is like mine, to be like Jesus. That you want to say, yes, I want to change. I want to be more like the way he wants me to be. I want to live for him. I don't want to live a life of don'ts. I want to live a life of do's. And I don't just want to do, I want to be. Many of you say, well, I can't do anything in the church. But you can be, can't you? You can be an encourager. You can be a servant to other people. You can pray for other people. There's many things that you can do in the fellowship of this church. God wants you to laugh. He wants you to sing. He wants you to dance. He wants you to be full of joy and love and happiness. I was going to have another song at the end of the service and uh, he goes like this, I'm so happy and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. Maybe if you summon that, I was going to sing it but I, I pity, pity you there and I won't, uh, I won't make you listen to that. <laughs> Jesus took my burdens all away and when Jesus takes our burdens away and when we have our eyes focused on him and we have our eyes focused to the way he wants us to go, it changes our whole outlook on life. It gives you joy. It gives you happiness. It gives you peace. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be close to him. He wants you to love him more. You know the thing that God wants most of all? He wants you to worship him. That's what he wants. He wants us to be able to, when we think of God, not think of a, some old man up there who zaps everybody that does wrong. He wants us to worship him. Look at what God has done. Look around you. See what God has done, how great God is. We can't imagine how great God is. He wants us to worship him and to love him and to be obedient to him. And after all, isn't that the best kind of life? I pray that God will bless you as you seek to be more like him. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you that we're able to, to read your word and uh, just to examine ourselves and see the way that we are. Lord, you know what's going on in our hearts. You know what our difficulties are and our problems. You know what we desire. Lord, I pray that each of us may be transformed, changed into the likeness of Jesus, step by step, day by day, until at last when we see Jesus face to face, we can say, I am like him. Help us to be more like you day by day. Help us to love you and trust you and be obedient to your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to sing that song now. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever new. Would you like to stand as we sing it together?